Before we begin, don't forget that there are currently three applications out for the Queen's Gambit Decline available for iPhone and for Android. Welcome back to ChessOpenings.com. In today's video, we'll take a look at the opening phase of a game played between Grandmaster Levon Aronian and Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura. The game starts out with the King's Indian defense, beginning with the moves pawn to d4, knight to f6, Nakamura has the black pieces, Levon Aronian has the white pieces, white continued knight to f3, and the move pawn to c4 is also a very common move here. Pawn to g6 was played, pawn to c4, and now bishop to g7, leading to a position known as the King's Indian defense. Now, with this defense, Black has simply developed his king's side pieces in a very logical way, bringing the king's knight out to the f6 square and fianchettoing the bishop, placing it on the g7 square, a maneuver which is known as fianchettoing the bishop. To begin with, Black is now ready to castle king's side, but perhaps more importantly, in this particular opening, the king's Indian, Black has restrained himself from advancing his central pawns early in order to see how white replies. There are different kinds of setups available for white in this position. One option would be to continue with the move pawn to g3 and then bishop to g2. This would be mirroring the concept of the king's side fianchetto developing the light squared bishop to a long diagonal and then white can over time make use of the extra space provided by his advanced pawns on d4 and c4 and use these to develop his pieces further and eventually aim to achieve the move pawn to e4. However, in this game, Levon Aronian plays a setup known as the classical variation. White continued with knight to c3, black castled kingside, and now white simply occupied the center with the move pawn to e4. And this is the most common response to the king's Indian setup that black has here in the game. Now, the whole effort of this video will be to look at how white is able to translate this spatial advantage in the center. White has three pawns situated in the center. How does white translate that into a game winning advantage. So let's take a look. Black continued with the move pawn to d6 and this is useful for a few reasons. One idea might be that black is restraining the move pawn to e5 but in fact white doesn't want to play the move pawn to e5 so quickly since after knight to e8 and now moves like pawn to d6 or pawn to c5 black will have opportunities to undermine the center and white will find himself behind in development. Instead, the more common reason behind the move pawn to d6 is actually to support black in staking a claim in the center with either the move pawn to e5, which is most common, or pawn to c5. So pawn to d6 was played, bishop to e2 was played, and now black continued with the most common move here, pawn to e5. Now, this move always looks a little paradoxical in this position, since black is cementing the pawn on a square which is directly in front of the g7 bishop. However, the idea behind this move is to take into consideration what's going to happen next when black eventually brings his knight out to the c6 square. If black plays the move pawn to c5, and white castles kingside, black does not yet have the opportunity to develop his queen's knight as adequately as he'd like, since after the move knight to c6, white is now able to play the move d4 to d5 when the knight on c6 actually has a lack of good squares to develop to. In most games which reach this position, Black actually placed the knight on the a5 square, but from here there are a variety of different plans available to white, especially on the king side, which tend to make use of the fact that this knight is completely off sides 
in this position. By contrast, when Black plays the move pawn to e5, as he did here in the game, and then White castles kingside, now after the most common move, knight to c6, pawn to d5, all of this was played in the game, now Black has access to the square e7 for the knight. And this is a totally different situation from having to place the knight offsides on the a5 square. From e7, the knight now prepares the move f7 to f5, and of course the knight is better situated for the rest of the struggle. Now, there are a number of different ways that white can continue in this position in order to make use of his space advantage in the center. Presently, the big difference between the two positions is that white's pawn on d5 is much further advanced than the pawn on d6, and the white pawn on c4 is also more advanced than the pawn on c7. White can make use of these factors by first of all making better use of the squares behind the pawns in order to maneuver his pieces, and secondly, by a well-timed advance of the C pawn, white can begin to create weaknesses in the opponent's position. Some of the most common moves here include pawn to b4, setting up an eventual pawn to c5 here, knight to e1 with the idea of repositioning the knight to d3, and then again looking for this move pawn to c5, or another option is knight to d2, whereupon white is most often reserving the knight on the d2 square so that after c4 to c5 and a capture takes place on d6, the knight will be able to come to c4 as a way of increasing the attack on the d6 point. So this is another method of repositioning the knight. Now in fact, in this game, Levon Aronian played the move knight to e1, preparing to redeploy this knight to the d3 square. Now, Black's plan in this position is relatively straightforward. Black's aim is to achieve the move f7 to f5 as quickly as he possibly can, as this is the most logical pawn break that he has access to in this position. Both sides are primarily occupied with the same point in this position. They've both completed a certain level of development of their pieces and managed to castle on the king side. Now from here, the question is how to increase the scope of the pieces and begin to create weaknesses in the opponent's camp. By continuing with the move knight to d7, which is the move that Nakamura played in this game, Black is beginning to slowly but surely unfold some chances of his own by liberating the pawn on f7 and preparing to bring it up to the f5 square. Ideally, this pawn could make it all the way out to the f4 square, and then, as black begins to reposition his pawns and pieces on the king's side, black can begin to move the pawns and pieces up the board close to the king and create some king's side attacking chances. In this sense, I often call the King's Indian a very philosophical opening, because Black has managed to avoid occupying the center in the way that he traditionally does in most openings. He's simply given White the opportunity to bring his D-pawn and C-pawn clear up the board, but his argument is that because his attack F7 to F5 to F4 is primarily directed against the king in the long term, Black is arguing that since the king will come under attack, his attack has additional merit, whereas even though white's attack is more supported by the position at this time, white's attack does not have the same stakes as the king. So traditionally we see that white very often succeeds with his queenside attack, but he still has a major headache in that black's attack is directed against the king, and if Black's attack succeeds, even at the expense of remarkable material loss on the queen side, 
Black will still have won the game since the game ends with checkmate. So knight to d7 was played in this position, knight to d3 was played, and now Black continued with the move f7 to f5, preparing to bring these pawns up the board on the king side. Now, white continued with bishop to d2, and this simply prepares to bring a rook to the c1 square, either immediately or after queen to c2, followed by rook f to c1. So bishop d2 completes development and vacates the c1 square. Black continued with the move knight to f6, repositioning the knight back to the f6 square, and at the same time putting some additional pressure on the e4 pawn. This forced white to continue with pawn to f3, and only now did black advance the pawn to the f4 square. And this point about having forced white to first play pawn to f3 is very clever because it creates a hook or a lever in the position against which black can eventually play for the move pawn to g4. Now if this pawn reaches the g4 square, the pawn will be in direct contact with the pawn on f3, which gives an opportunity to capture and open the g-file, or the pawn could even make it clear out to the g3 square, which has also been weakened by the move f2 to f3, and both of these factors are the good reason why black played knight to f6 and forced f2 to f3 before playing pawn to f4 himself. Now, white continued with the move c4 to c5, and now the move pawn to g5 was played. Pawn takes pawn on d6, pawn takes pawn on d6, and now white is able to reveal another point that comes in handy from this earlier maneuver, knight e1 to d3. Since black is mostly pinning his hopes upon achieving the move g5 to g4, white now retreats the knight to the f2 square, whereupon it holds down the g4 square. White now has one, two, three, four defenders of the g4 square, whereas black currently only has two, meaning that black is still a couple defenders away from being able to achieve the move g5 to g4. And while it's perhaps easy for him to bring a pawn up to h5 and add one more defender, finding the second defender turns out to be a little bit of a quandary for black. Black now continued with the move knight to g6. And this has a couple of different ideas in mind. In the first place, eventually the knight may find it handy to come out to the h4 square as a means of helping to assist black's attack. For example, if a pawn reaches g4 and a knight reaches h4 at the correct moment, then the opportunity to capture on f3 with a pawn or even to exploit the open g file thereafter may be increased by the presence of a knight on the h4 square. Additionally, in some cases, after black has inserted the moves h5 and h3 and the knight reaches h4, Sacrificing the knight on the g2 square can sometimes be a very powerful recipe that allows black to continue making damage in the king's side position and playing for an all-out attack. But at this time, we simply have the move knight to g6 on the board. Another point behind the move knight g6 is revealed after Aronian's continuation, queen to c2, this is very common, and now rook to f7. This is a very subtle idea here, because the rook can not only reposition itself to the g7 square, which often happens after bishop to f8 and rook to g7, again, beginning to add a defender to the g4 square and beginning to add to the possibilities of prying open the g-file. But additionally, after the rook comes to the f7 square, black has an extra defender of the c7 square and therefore, after white continues rook f to c1, now when white plays the move knight to b5, as he often does, 
Black tends to find that he has enough defense of the c7 square in order to prevent an infiltration, knight b5 to c7, and then often this knight can come to e6 with damaging situation here. The game continued rook f to c1, and now black continued with the move knight to e8, providing additional coverage of the c7 square and also opening up the diagonal for the queen on d8. Play now continued with a very typical move for white in the king's Indian. <clears throat> white played the move pawn to a4. Now this move may be a little bit more tricky to understand for players who are new to these kinds of positions. With the move pawn to a4, white is opening up some space behind the eight pawn which he could find useful for maneuvering. For example, if the knight does indeed come to the b5 square, now if the knight is kicked away, the knight, in addition to having the c3 square available, may also retreat to a3 without blocking the a pawn. And just as significantly, whenever black plays the move pawn to a6, the pawn on a4 could very much come in handy for coming to the a5 square, fixing the weaknesses on b7 and on b6. And by fixing weaknesses, I simply mean that now the pawn on a5 defends the b6 square and can be used to protect a piece which might come into the b6 square or to capture any pawn which advances to b6 or to b5 using the en passant rule, thereby creating a weakness on the a6 point after the exchange of pawns. And that's if black is able to play pawn to b6 or pawn to b5 at all. So the move pawn to a4 was played. Pawn to h5 was played, continuing to play for the move g5 to g4. Now, in the majority of games which had so far reached this position, White most commonly continued to protect the g4 square with the move pawn to h3. And then many of these games continued, let's say knight to h4 and knight to b5, and White continued to wriggle for some kind of attack on the queen side. And these positions had turned out to be roughly okay for both sides, with White perhaps having a very slight initiative in these positions. However, in this game, Aronian uncorked a completely different move here that so far had not been played in this position. White played the move knight c to d1. With this move, the knight may be positioned to add a defender to the king's side under certain circumstances. And additionally, White reserves the opportunity here of now playing rook a3 to c3 as a method of increasing his attack. And importantly, he hasn't created additional weaknesses on the king's side with h2 to h3. It's not 100% clear whether this quirky move knight c to d1 is at all stronger than the move h2 to h3. But by playing in this way, Aronian was able to bring in a whole number of different strategic ideas that so far had not been introduced into this particular position. Later on, we'll see that White was able to play the move rook a3 to c3 as a potential idea in this position. Also, White was able to play queen c3 to a5, and this was a little bit more important, threatening a trade of queens and thereby neutralizing some of Black's queen kingside attacking possibilities. It's always very important for Black in the King's Indian to maintain the queens on the board if he's looking for a kingside attack. And by going for this maneuver, queen c3 to a5, Aronian was able to threaten a trade of queens and also create some additional problems for Black on the queen side. Perhaps most interestingly of all, whenever a player at such a high level introduces a novelty like the move knight c to d1, he achieves certain psychological and time management advantages on the clock. 
Aronian was able to force Nakamura to start looking for brand new ideas in this position from a strategic viewpoint and to expire some of the point, some of the time on his clock. By doing so, it's not so much that Aronian managed to introduce a strong move into the position, though the move knight cdd1 may indeed be quite strong, but importantly, he managed to increase the number of strategic ideas available in the position. After Black continued with the move bishop to f8, which is ideally preparing rook to g7, White then continued with the move rook to a3. And this can have some different ideas in mind, but of course, the rook is looking to come to the c3 square, or at the very least, the rook can be very useful in defending the third rank. Since now, if a pawn comes to g4, and when it's possible to do so, the rook adds defense to f3, or even after an exchange of pawns on g4, the rook can add defense to both the f3 and g3 squares, making it harder for black to achieve a decisive pawn break. Now, interestingly, Nakamura continued pawn to a6, and now after the move queen to c3, Aronian is preparing to play the move queen to a5, threatening an exchange of queens, and the position is going to continue from here, with white looking to provoke certain weaknesses in the queen side camp, and black is still looking to achieve his attack with an eventual g5 to g4. This position is very interesting, but the conclusion so far is that black is still quite a ways off from achieving g5 to g4, but it's not totally clear how Aronian is planning to make progress on the queen side. We'll have to wait for the next video to find out how it is that Aronian was able to create substantial chances on the queen side, eventually break through, and win this important game involving this novelty of knight c to d1. For now, we'll leave the game with this setup, having explained the various plans which both sides had available in the King's Indian, and having set the stage for the look at the rest of this game. That's all for today, and we'll see you again soon. Before you go, be sure to check out the two applications we have available for the King's Indian Defense, available for iPhone and for Android.